Okay, well, welcome back to our course. And so now the first chapter that we're going to get into in this is introductory section is the basic concepts in computer evolution. And so um, this would be the, the first chapter that we're going to get in, in depth into um, our in our course. And so this is the material that we'll be covering. And so we'll be thinking in terms of the organization and architecture, structure and function of computer systems. We'll introduce something called the IAS computer. So this is um, really on in the development of computers and personal computers. And so in a, just a few minutes, I, I'll clarify what that is. We'll talk about the things that computer architectures are made out of, gates, memory cells, chips, and multi-chip modules. So each one of those things are part of what is involved for, for making a operational computer. We'll talk about the evolution of the Intel 86 architecture. Then we'll talk, finish up with two other topics. First of all, talking about um, embedded systems, Internet of Things or IoT. And then we'll get into the ARM architecture, how it has evolved, um, talk about its operating um, instruction set and the various types of products are, are made available. So this is a chart that's trying to give us a sense of the computer architecture and computer organization, the different quadrants that you can think of. And so in describing computers, a distinction is made often between computer architectures and computer organization. Although it is difficult to give a precise definition for these terms, a consensus exists about the general areas covered by each. An interesting alternative view um, is in one of the references if you look at the textbook, but I'm not going to get into that. So computer architecture refers to those attributes of a system visible to a programmer, or put another way, those attributes that have a direct impact on the logical execution of a program. So uh, the instruction set architecture, or ISA, is a, another term that we'll be exposed to. The ISA defines instructions, formats, instruction opcodes, another term that we'll get into as we go through the course, registers, instruction, and data memory, the effect of execution, executed instructions on the, the registers and memory, and an algorithm for controlling instruction execution. On the flip side, computer organization refers to operational units and their interconnections that realize the architectural specifications. And so this may be just to have a way, have you think about that, the difference between computer architecture and computer organization. So um, I know this predates you all, but one of the first um, computer systems out there was the IBM 370, 360, and then the 370. And so this was introduced into the 1970s and includes a number of models. One could upgrade to a more expensive, faster model while without having to abandon the original software. New models are introduced in improved technology, but retain the same architecture that the customer software investment is protected. The architecture has survived to this day as the architecture of IBM's mainframe product line. And so... This is just an illustration of what it might have looked like. And so you have a, a relatively speaking, a dumb terminal, and it would be communicating with racks and racks of equipment that would be necessary to make that work. In terms of structure and function, um, there's a hierarchical system, the, the set of interrelated subsystems. You know, hierarchical nature of, of complex system is essential to both their design and their description. The designer needs only to, to deal with a particular level of the system at a time. That's the concerning thing, concerned with structure and function at each level. And then for the structure, the, the way, what we're thinking about here, the way in which the components relate to each other and the function is a relation of individual components as part of the, the structure. So a, a computer is a complex system, a contemporary computers contain millions of elementary electronic components. And so that's something that we'll get a chance to get a little bit of an insight into what it means. The hierarchical nature of complex systems is essential to both the design and their description. Um, so that's just maybe a little bit more context for this chart. 
So next, let's talk about, get into a little bit more specific about function, both the structure and function of a computer in, in essence is simple in general terms. There are four basic functions that a computer can perform. So number one would be the data processing. The, the data may be a wide variety of formats and the range of processing requirements is broad. However, we shall see that the only a few fundamental methods of types of data processing are, are out there. Next, we have data storage. Even in a computer, even if the computer is processing data on the fly, that is like real time, the computer must temporarily store at least those pieces of data that are being worked on at any given moment. Thus, there are at least a short-term data storage function that is necessary for a computer to, to operate. For data movement, the computer's operation environment consists of devices that serve as either sources or destination of data. And so that's something that we, we need to be thinking about, the input and output, I.O., the, the data communication, all of that has to be handled. And finally, the control. With the computer, a control unit manages the computer's resources and orchestrates the performance of the functional parts in response to instructions. So this is an illustration of a top-level structure of a computer. So um, we can now look in a general way at the internal structure of a computer. We begin with a traditional computer with a single processor that employs a micro con program control unit, then examine a typical multi-core structure. And so this is trying to show you that the, the things that you have for a computer, the, the CPU, the memory, and the input and output, that's what's called the von Neumann architecture. And then you have the ways that you connect all those things together. Here we're getting into more details for the central processing unit. Um, the arithmetic logic unit, registers, and the control unit. Once again, you need to have the internal bus that connects it all. And then for a control unit, you can have um, sequencing of logic, the registers and decoders, and can control memory. So that's just uh, one of the ways that you can start to break that down. So we have the, the four main structural components of computer. The first three are what's called the, the von Neumann architecture, the central processing unit, the main memory, and then the input and output. But another area is everything needs to be connected. And so that's going to be something that is needs to be book kept. Sometimes you can be thinking about that um, in input and output. But um, if we wanted to make it a separate line item, then we can have those four those are the three things that are required. We had a, a visual of this, thinking about the central processing unit as a standalone thing. And so it has four different things, a control unit that operates, it controls the operation of the CPU, and hence, as a result of that, controls the whole computer. The arithmetic and logic unit, ALU, this performs the computer's data processing function, and we'll be spending some time on that, getting into more details. The registers, there's various types of registers that um, store internal information in the CPU. And then there's the, the, the CPU interconnections. There has to be some mechanism that provides for communication among the control unit, the ALU, and the registers. So multi-core computer structures, the, the latter part of this course is we'll, we'll be focusing on this. And so, uh, contemporary computers generally have multi, multiple processors. When these processors all reside in a single ship, the term is called a multi-core computer. And each processing unit consists of a control unit, an ALU, registers, and perform, perhaps some cache, which is another term that we'll be getting into when we'll explore that. So um, this is just some, some more details that help to, to provide some context. So for the central processing unit, this portion of a computer that, that, that fetches and executes instructions. Fetch execute is something that's going to be something that we'll be talking about as we get into pipelines, um, computing pipelines. The core and individual process is refers to an individual processor unit or processor chip. And so that would be something that we're going to be talking about. Processor is a physical piece of silicon containing one or more cores. 
And so this is just some of the details here that we're trying to try and capture here with this chart. So for cash, this is the term that I mentioned. Cash is um, another way that's found that really helps improve the performance of computing um, that maybe doesn't sound very intuitive, but you have this, this buffering, if you will, that is, that is created. And so there's multiple layers of memory between the processor and the main memory. Um, is um, smaller and faster than the main memory. So this is, needs to be very responsive and it's used to speed up memory access by placing the cache data from main memory that is likely to be used in the near future. So if you know this is gonna be used a lot, you put it in, a, in an area or using the term again, cache that is easily accessible so you don't have to go all the way to the main memory. Um, a greater in performance Improvement may be obtained by using multiple layers of cache. And this is something that is, is done. You can have L1, L2, L3, and maybe even more. And so that is something that we'll get a chance to be thinking about more as we move along. So here is a simplified view of the major elements of a multi-core computer. We have the processing chip. Here we're showing an example where there's four cores. We have um, various types of cache here. You have L3 cache here. L1 and L2, um, we're showing different cache for the instructions and the, the, the data. Um, and so this is what we're, we're expanding on as we go. And so I apologize, we actually have eight cores, four on the top and four on the bottom, as we're trying to show in this figure. For an actual picture of a motherboard with two Intel quad-core Xeon processors, we can be seeing what this would look like. Um, the various and input and outputs that would be on this processor board, um, the, the motherboard. Um, so we have memory, we have the, the processors, we have the input and outputs, we have other things that you may be familiar with, um, a SATA interface. Even that is starting to give way to another interface, but I won't, won't get into that now. Various type of universal service bus connections how we would be connecting to a terminal um, uh, display and ethernet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of different types of connections that are available. This is trying to, to show the specific layout for a processor. So this is for an IBM Z13 processor. I won't get into to details about this, but that's just a representative of what that would like. And so here is it gets a little bit deeper looking at the, the core layout, one of the individual cores that is laid out in the previous figure. So the let's think about the, the history of computing all the way back to the first generation when it was before they used transistors, they actually used vacuum tubes. So vacuum tubes were used for digital logic elements and memory, the, the most fundamental area of what a computing um, um, capability is all about. There's something called the Institute for Advanced Studies. And so this was something that Princeton started. And so this is where we start to have an IAS computer. And we'll see that acronym used as we progress here in this chapter. So the, the fundamental design approach was the, the stored program concept, and so it's attributed to von Neumann. And so I mentioned the von Neumann architecture. And so it was first published in 1945. And the, the design began with the Institute for Advanced Studies at, at Princeton in 1952 and, and prototypes of the subsequent general computer, general purpose computers emerged from, from that. So this is what um, a figure look like for the IAS structure, the Institute for Advanced Studies. And so you have the, the main memory, you have the, the control unit, you have the, the central processing unit. And so the control unit would be in there. So basically have your memory, your CPU and your input and output. And so those are the three elements of your von Neumann architecture. And we're getting more specific, more detailed. Um, we have the arithmetic logic unit, um, we have the controller and we have the ways that things um, connect to memory um, as we're showing in this figure. So here is the, the, the memory format. And so 
we're doing a command, we'll get into more details of this when we talk about assembly language programming, but you need to have various types of things that are here, an ops codes, what you're going to do, and then the address, what are you going to do it on? And so here we're, we're talking about just um, simple, relatively um, speaking instructions, 20 bits long, and you have two that are aggregated together in a single instruction word. And then you can have a, a number word. There's a sign bit and the rest of them would just be the details of the, how you're trying to represent that, that number. So this will be useful to get into this before we get into the next figure. And so there's a variety of different registers, a memory buffer reg register or MBR, memory address register, MAR, instruction register, IR, instruction buffer register, IBR, program counter PC, accumulator AC, and multiplier quotient MQ. And so um, you can just refer back to, to this slide to give you a, a better sense of the, all of these different acronyms that are laid out here. So the IS operates by repetitively performing an instruction cycle as is shown in this figure. And so um, I'm not gonna get into this in detail, but you have the fetch cycle and the execute cycle. So fetch, execute, fetch, execute. And then when you're done with the execute, you go, you go back and then if there's a next instruction, you continue to do the, the fetch and then you do the execute. Um, so this is the high level way of thinking of a pipeline architecture. And this is um, a partial flowchart for the IAS operation, one of the earliest ways when computing would start to be envisioned. The way that this is look, um, shown here, we're starting to get an idea of what it would be like to program in assembly language. And this would be for the Institute for Advanced Studies, the IAS instruction set. And so here is what the, the symbolic representation would look like. So if we were um, programming in assembly language for an IAS computer, this is what it would be looking like. What it would look like in binary, this is, you've seen that there's a unique relationship for each one of these um, commands. And so this is what you would put here. And um, we're gonna see some more details about this as, as we go. So the IAS computer had a total of 21 instructions. And you can see that that's not very many, relatively speaking, but I would argue that you could do anything that a more complicated, robust um, assembly language or upper um, high level language could do with these 21 um, different types of instructions. But it turns out for performance, it made sense to start to have more than just those 21. So here we have um, just a couple fundamental computer elements. And first we have a, um, a gate, and then we have a memory cell. We need to be able to store memory. So this is how we store it. And so with a gate, and we'll be talking about um, the digital logic, things like AND or um, an inverter. And then there's some more complicated ones that go a little bit beyond that. So basically, this is all Boolean logic where you have multiple inputs and you do something as an aggregation based on what is determined by the logic that you set up with the, the, the different things that are laid out there. So we have gates that capture um, the way that we're going to uh, combine those inputs and then having memory. So here we just have a quick survey of the kind of things that computers are made of. And so integrated circuits are a, a big thing. And so um, it, we, in integrated circuits, there's data storage, data processing, data movement and control, all of these basic elements that we're familiar with. And so um, we are, need to have that represented in the way that we do in the, the silicon and the actual hardware, microelectronics. So a computer consists of gates, memory cells, and interconnections, among other elements. And the gates and memory cells are constructed in simple digital electronic components. We're going to get a chance to play with that in the class, and you can see what that would look like. 
It exploits the fact that such components are transistors, resistors, and conductors can be fabricated from a semiconductor such as silicon. And many transistors can be produced at the same time on a, on a single wafer. And transistors can be connected with a processor mentalization to form circuits. So um, the transistor is, is a fundamental building block of digital circuits. Using the, the vacuum tube wasn't very efficient. And there's a really um, a huge savings in terms of size as well as power. So that's one of the reasons why it has um, definitely come into prominence. So processors, memories, and other digital logic devices are all made out of transistors. An active part of the tra transistor is made of silicon or some other semiconductor material that can change its electrical state when, when pul pulsed. Um, gallium arsenide is another example of material. You can also have discrete components. And so um, we're really not gonna get into that in this course too much, but you can be thinking about that. So when you actually fabricate microelectronics, you typically do it on a large wafer. And then what you do is you cut it up into pieces um, and a prescribed level. And so this is what this chip would look like. It's You have this one thing represented here. You then have elements on this chip would be a specific gate that would be represented with multiple layers of microelectronics and interconnects. And then you have to package it. And this is how we would actually put it on a motherboard and actually use this. So this is what a, a motherboard would look like. And so a close up of a, a packaged chip and so it's actually soldered onto the motherboard. And so this is just another picture of other things that are um, on there. So you have a processor. So over here, processor, and then you have a memory on another area of the, the motherboard, trying to give you a sense of how that would look like. So there's been a huge growth in the, the, the transistor count on integrated circuits over time. This just gives you an idea starting in 1947 when the first working transistor was illustrated in a constant progression of um, how it would, would go. And so we'll get into this shortly in the next chart. We'll talk about Moore's law, but you can see that this is roughly shows like a linear line here. Um, it's actually logarithmic, but um, according to the way that this, this chart is set up, you can see that it looks roughly linear. So Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, is a person that noticed this, um, this relationship. And so that basically the pace um, of electronics would double every 18 months. And so this continued for quite some time, but now at this point, we're getting into a post Moore's law area where we're getting microelectronics that are getting down to um, at atomic and molecular levels where it's hard to go any smaller. And so it's starting to level off. So this gives you an idea what a, a multi-chip module can look like. And so you can have multiple chips and you can be put this all in the same package. And so literally you can have a whole computer on a single printed circuit board, motherboard, or within a, a specific package um, and that's where we can get some quite amazing level of performance and, and packaging that's pretty powerful. Okay, I, I'm gonna have four charts here that give you an evolution of the Intel microprocessors um, all the way back to 1971. Um, here we have in 1978, the 8086. And so this was um, where we have this term x86. This is the first time where we had that. Um, and so there was an 8085 and then an 8086. And we're, we're talking about some relatively um, low performing, but still things that were quite amazing at the time. Um, you can think of a clock speed of two megahertz um, going up to, to 10 megahertz, that's not very fast according to what we're familiar with today. Into the 80s, they started to replicate the um, 86, going from 86 to 286. And so this is what we start to, to see here, variations of other types of um, going to the 386 and then 486. The, the clock speeds are starting to, to go higher 
the number of transistors increasing, um, the, the amount of virtual memory that it can handle is going up. And so here we're still talking about, um, we started with um, um, eight, four eight bits and then up to, to, to 16 bits. Then the big transition was going to 32 bits with the 386 architecture in some forms. And then we then progressed from there, we're going into the 486. And then instead of calling it a 586, they called it a Pentium, Pentium Pro. And then uh, going from there, going to Pentium 2. And that was things that started to go from, from there. And then we had this next transition going from 32 bits to 64 bits for the, the bus. And um, having the, the virtual addressable memory now is at 64 terabytes. We have that. And then finally, um, even this doesn't have all of the, the most current because it's continued to progress the Pentium all the way up to the Pentium 4. Then we got into the, the core, the dual core and um, i7, i9. And so just it gives you a nice capture of the progression if you wanted to get a chance to be seen that in a few summary charts. So just some highlights of the evolution. And so we have the 8080, the world's fir um, first general purpose microprocessor. It was only eight bits. The x86 was really the, the start of, we had this progression in that created the x86 ar architecture. It was a 16 bit machine. Um, the 286 extended that. The, the 386 was the first 32 bit machine. Um, it also supported multitasking. The, the 486 introduced the use of more sophisticated and powerful caching. So this is where caching start to be showing a, 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 an impact to be improving per performance. And this is just continuing on from there, the Pentium, Pentium Pro, Pentium 2, Pentium 3, Pentium 4, and then the Core and the Core 2. And it just goes on and on. I'm not going to go through the details, but you can feel free to pause this or look over these um, lecture notes and take a, um, a few minutes to, to look over that in more detail. So a lot of that is based on the things that you would be using for um, scientific programming, desktop computing. And then the other thing would be for embedded systems, internet of things. And so basically the use of electronics and software within products is becoming more and more widespread. Billions of computer systems are produced each year with embedded systems. And so this is something that definitely we don't want to be remiss and not to, to talk about. Um, often embedded systems are tightly coupled to their environments. And so they're, they're simple, they're focused. Um, and so a microcontroller might be a better word at, in, instead of just thinking about a central processing unit in terms of what it's trying to to be thinking and what it's trying to, to do. So here's a possible organization of embedded systems. You can have um, custom, custom logic that you have that you're trying to, to work on things. You could have diagnostic information. Um, so you have a port that's um, connecting with that. You can have um, digital analog conversion and then have it connected to actuators. You can have an analog to digital conversion and have sensors. And so this would be ways of how you can be connecting your human interfaces. All of these are the possibilities in which you can be having it um, connected to a processor in, a, in an embedded system. So quite a um, wide variety of things that, that is captured there. So the Internet of Things, this is a term that refers to the expanding interconnections of smart devices ranging from applications to tiny sensors. It's primarily driven by deeply embedded systems. Generations of deployment um, culminating in the IoT. And so the various ways and places where it's, it's being used is information technology, various PC servers, and having um, a connectivity that's going down to embedded devices. You can have operational technology um, where you have machines and appliances that have embedded um, IT built in by non-IT companies. So maybe it's medical machinery, SCADA. This is how, say, for um, the 
power grid or things like that. They have SCADA type of units, various um, process control kiosks. All of those are things that in terms of operational technology, things that have create the conveniences that we know in our modern life, personal te um, technology, your, your smartphones, tablets, eBooks, readers, et cetera. These are all things that can have a microcontroller or things that gets into this internet of things. And finally, um, sensors and actuator technology um, for various things, whatever it might be, a, um, a, a automatic door opener where it has sensors and then responds when somebody comes there, that would be an example of an embedded technology. So it is the fourth generation that is usually thought of as the Internet of Things, and it is marked by the use of billions of embedded devices. So we can be thinking of the contrast between the embedded operating systems, and so we don't need all the bells and whistles that you would need for an, a complex operating system for your desktop or, or laptop. So there are two general approaches to developing an embedded operating system. Take an existing OS, sorry about that, and adapt it for embedded applications or design and implement an OS intended solely for embedded system. A real-time operating system is an example of what that could look like. You can be thinking of application processors versus dedicated processors. Application processors are defined by the process ability to execute complex operations. So this would be things that you would be thinking for a laptop um, or um, a desktop or a workstation. Um, a dedicated processor is something that is more focused and it's um, really good for doing, doing a, a microcontroller to, to do things. And you're also trying to be thinking about how to reduce size and cost for its application. So I've used this term a couple of times, a microcontroller, but here can be the things of how you can be um, optimizing things for um, the internet of things, um, where you have a processor that has a lot of um, inputs and outputs that are easily accessible to the processor to do a specific function, not multiple functions, but to be doing for a dedicated function is going to be the some of the primary things that it's going to have. It can have various types of memory. It can have programmable um, memory that's burn in once, so it's permanent data. Um, and so um, these are some, some of the things that would be that should we upload the data into, say, like an Arduino unit. We'll get a chance to be seeing what, what that is like, or a Raspberry Pi, maybe a higher end for a microcontroller. So um, deeply embedded system, this is a subset of embedded system that has a processor whose behavior is difficult to observe, both by the program and the user. It uses a microcontroller rather than a microprocessor. So it's a more dedicated for embedded. It's not programmable once the program logic for the dice has been burned into the ROM. So it has read-only memory. You get want to get it right because once it's burned in, it, it's, it's, it's only going to do that one dedicated single purpose type of function for the its whole life in its um, wherever it's being deployed. Can often have wireless capability and appear in network configurations. And it typically has a extreme resource constraints in terms of memory, processor size, time, and power consumption. So we've already briefly mentioned this in the introduction, but the ARM is the Acorn Risk Machine or Advanced Risk Machine. And so it refers to a process architecture that is evolved from risk design. And um, the family of risk-based microprocessors and microcontrollers are designed by the arms holding in Cambridge, England. Chips are high-speed processors that are known for their small die size and low power requirements, and probably the most widely used and better processor, processor architecture, indeed the most widely used processor architecture of any kind of world. So definitely has a, a following here, just example, are a listing of the ARM products. And a, a few of these are ones that we'll be focusing in more detail as we go through this course. So one of those is the Cortex-M3. 
And so we can see that listed here. This is just getting into the, the, the details on multiple layers. First of all, we have the microcontroller chip for the ARM. Um, we then can be looking at a, um, the Cortex M3 processor, having a blowout of that, and then having a blowout for a co core. So this is a single core device, and we can be thinking about all the things that we're familiar with, that you need to have an arithmetic unit, you need to have a controller, you need to have memory. Um, there's some, some basic things that you need to have in a processing core, and that's captured there. All right, that's going to finish it for this first chapter. So as a result, we've gone through an organization, architecture, structure, and function of computers. We introduced what the IAS computer architecture, one of the first way of conceiving that. We gave an overview of how the, the various things that are used to form a computer architecture implementation are done. We went quickly through the evolution of the Intel 86 architecture. We talked about embedded systems, focusing a lot on the internet of things and how those are, are considered. And we finished up with the ARM architectures and real quickly went over the ARM products. All right, thank you very much.